Hi, my name is Michael Kramer and welcome to the We Make It Work Corporate Real Estate Podcast. Today, I'm in discussion with the authors of a new book. The book is a collaboration between the Royal Institute of British Architects and experts from across Cushman and Wakefield and is entitled Reworking Workplace, Connecting People, Purpose and Place. So a warm welcome to Nicola Gillen and her co-authors, Richard Pickering, Zoe Humphreys and Sophie Schuler. Great. Let's jump straight in and let's start with you, Nicola. Tell us a little bit about, the, I guess, the premise of the book and why have you and the ROBA collaborated now to write it? Yeah, so the, the book is about the future of work, workplace in the city, and there hasn't been a moment like this in terms of the revolution of work since the computers came into offices. So it's an amazing time to look at it. There's a huge amount of opinion out there. So we wanted to try and bring some more data to the debate and uh, also case studies from around the world of what others are doing in reality. And there's a few principles that we'll talk about now on this call, like, for example, work and community are inextricably linked and work is a fundamental driver of place in the city and place has a really key role in human connection, community and positive social impact. And so Sophie will talk a little bit more about that in terms of how work itself has changed because of the pandemic. Great. And if we switch now to you, Sophie, and welcome from, I guess you're sitting somewhere in, in the Netherlands today. What are the major changes to how we are working, obviously, in this post-pandemic world? Yeah, I, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, the first thing that I would identify is that all of the changes that we have ascribed to the post-pandemic environment were happening already before the pandemic. But what we saw during the pandemic was this mass adoption and speeding up the acceleration, if you like, of some of those changes that otherwise would have taken a, a disproportionately long time. I think the other aspect that we're really seeing, if you like, is a redistribution between the agency and power, if you like, between employers and employees. And we're seeing that employees are becoming increasingly more powerful in, in the context of that relationship and starting to demand experiences, have expectations of, of not only work, but the work environment. And that, that is a change from previous times when people would kind of take a job, show up, and that was enough. And I think one one of those dimensions that's really driving that shift to employee power is, of course, during the pandemic, an increasing appreciation of health and well-being. And we're starting to see that aspects that were previously considered personal, such as health and well-being, are now starting to take on yeah. a role within the organization. And organizations are now starting to become, to some degree, responsible for individuals' health and well-being. And we have to really start to explore to what degree organizations need, need to take that role. I think the other aspects, of course, that are changing are more functional, you know, where we work, how we work, who we work with, who is at work. This opportunity of increased hybrid working provided a unique environment for people who've been previously excluded from the workplace to start to partake in the workplace, either through physical access restrictions or geography. We need to start seeing the uptake of, of that environment. And then, of course, the types of work that people are doing, whether that's technology-based, in-person collaboration, innovation, etc., all underpinned by the changing digital environment. Great. And, and as we know, obviously, technology was here pre-pandemic and has kind of gone on to fast forward. So, Rich, from your point of view, how's this virtual physical interface changing now we're out the other side of the pandemic and we've got all these new toys to play with? Yeah, I mean, you're right in saying technology was there before the pandemic, Michael. I think it goes back to sort of 3000 BC when we started sort of working fields. And I guess ever since then, we've tried to augment our own capabilities using technology to better enable our productivity. But I think there's, there's two ways that technology has taken a path over the course of history. One is that it's become smarter, obviously, from kind of fairly dumb kind of factory lines through to kind of AI that we're seeing coming through to the workforce now. The other is it's becoming more portable and, and through communications technology, and that's really important. So the kind of the impacts that this is having are both a macro and a micro level. You know, the macro one is the one we all know about, which is that the impacts of distance are being ameliorated by technology, and therefore people can work in a more distributed fashion. And the second is, is more micro in terms of if you think about how our offices are designed, 
they're largely designed to facilitate the interaction between a human and a monitor through keyboards and, and mice and other peripherals. And that really, if you think about how our offices look and feel and, 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 and work, it's very much defined around that principle. So as technology becomes more portable, more personal, it means we're going to be working more distributed fashion, but it also means the designer of offices are going to have to change quite significantly to cater for a, a much more flexible and human-centric way of working going forwards. Yeah, and I think it's, it is getting, I think, more and more complicated because we've, we've changed what we're used to, I guess. And so, Zoe, from your point of view, what are the implications of hybrid working and the role of workplace? What, what do we think is going to happen? Yeah, well, I think Rich summed it up for really well. Officers were designed in this pre-pandemic, as Nicholas said, almost pre-computer world, you know, designed where it was very low fidelity in this an analogue situation. We've gone through this big shift and people are wondering why they're not appealing. And now the workplace, as in the office, is a place where you can work, not the only place of work for most people. I think, therefore, it's really stepping back and rethinking. So what is it that this place, what is place making when you have a choice, when you have a palette of place to be, when you can, in some ways, work anywhere, when you bring people together, and you think about it holistically, what are those interconnections between people, purpose and place? And then how do we amplify that to create these amazing experiences that are compelling enough to draw people to get over the barrier of, of actually that time and that commute to that place of work? What is it that it gives back? How does it enable people to add value to the work that they do? And Nicola, maybe I'll throw it back to you. Can you talk a little bit about, um, I don't know if there are examples in the book, but about how management or how you see management shifting to deal with this? Because I think we're all in the same place, which we, we understand what's going on up to a point. But the way we run businesses and manage people presumably has to shift. Absolutely. And I think that's the main reason we're seeing some of these headlines in the press at the moment is we've been catapulted forward 20 years in terms of work and nobody was ready. Our systems weren't ready. Cloud exploded. Teams exploded in response. But managers and leaders were not ready. Nobody trained them. So they've been left trying to cope with this situation and everybody looking to them for the answers when it took a lot of people by surprise. Now, obviously there were people who expected it to happen, but it took an awful lot of people by surprise. So that's the main barrier that we're facing at the moment. And in a situation where people don't know what to do, they are defaulting to what worked last, which is about defaulting to the office and looking at mandates. But of course, we haven't had enough evolved time on mandating to show the implications of that. But trying to manage people is not an easy thing at the best of times. And people will be in a situation where they will create unpoliceable scenarios and they run the risk of disengaging their staff as a result of that. I think, Zoe, you said, you know, if you treat people like children, they're going to behave like children. But it's, I think we have to have a lot of sympathy for the leaders in this situation and we need to invest in programs and processes of knowledge management and community cohesion that's going to help them to manage this in a better way. But I think we're used to working with certain number of rules around how we how we work and what's expected of us, and and that's broken down, right? So, Sophie, where do you see that that going? Because it's a pretty tricky problem. Yeah, and I think one of the things that you're you're starting to allude to is this difference between explicit knowledge exchange and transfer and tacit knowledge exchange and transfer. And one of which, of course, the tacit aspect happens when we are physically together and we can't define it, we can't write it in a process, which means that actually when you try to convert it to an online environment, it's incredibly difficult to be able to do that. And I think one of the challenges that we'll have with work going forward is how do you start to create those tacit relationship-based moments and points of knowledge transfer in a way that is meaningful within an online community. I think with the, I mean, there's plenty in the in the book, obviously, Nicola, around what's going on with the workplace and getting people back in and, and these issues. If I switch it to you, Richard, and we think about the effect that might be having on the value of place. Again, plenty going on, some of it due to the economic circumstances that um, a lot of countries are in, but some of it seems to be more fundamental than that in terms of a, a shift in one direction. So do you want to open up on that? Yeah, sure. sure. And I, I agree. I, I think we are seeing progressive trends at the moment. Um, and I guess to start to answer that question, you've got to 
consider why does anything have value? And, and basically, it's because supply of, of whatever you're talking about is finite and there's demand for it. As we all know from the Mark Twain quote, supply of land is indeed finite, but that's not really a problem usually because most of land in the world is never used. You've, you've got these very intense demand concentrations around key population centers in the world. About 70% about of us work, shop, and live in about 3% of land. So why? Why do we choose to do that? Because that, if you, if you know the answer to that, that will answer your question. And, and I put it down to three things. The first is amenity. So we want to be close to things that can confer value on us. Historically, that was things like access to water and defensive locations. Now it's access to transport nodes or shopping centers, whatever, whatever that might be. Um, the second is agglomeration. And, and that means that people actually gain value from being near people, not just other assets or, or sources of, of value. And that has obviously been the case historically through things like the court that the king would set up and people would form a community around that. Nowadays, it takes the form of like tech agglomerations or accelerators, etc. And the third one is related to agglomeration, but less planned, i.e. when you put a lot of people into the same ecosystem, like sometimes chance encounters add value in a way that you weren't expecting them to. To answer your question there, Michael, if you think about what technology is doing, it's taking away the value of proximity to, to other stuff like amenities, because you can now do that online. I don't need to be in the office to use a printer anymore. I can just distribute it through digital files online. What is very difficult to synthesize digitally is that last factor of chance agglomeration or serendipity. And I think that's the thing that we're going to see place more emphasis on in the future and defining the value of place, whether that's through financial value or through the value that it place confers on the individual through productivity or enjoyment. I, I agree, Rich. I would add one dimension to that as well, which is I think we're in the middle of this shift in definition, if you like. We've always previously defined buildings and the built environments from a physical asset perspective. Even the basis of valuation is, of course, based on the physical aspect and the location. But what we're potentially seeing is a shift to defining the built environment as a social asset. And hopefully, as measurements start to become more objective in that, we'll start to be able to base potentially valuations of buildings and the built environment on the quality and value of the social interactions that take place there. So back to you, maybe you could expand on that and talk about how that comes to life in terms of the workplace? I think they need to think about what the purpose of that building is and who it's for. And I think if we think about it from the employee point of view or the people visiting that building, it switches the context slightly. As an individual, what is my return on investment of going to that place? As part of the research for the book, I interviewed Jim Gilmore, who along with Joe Pine wrote a book called Experience Economy, and they define the currency of experience as time. We've expanded that slightly mm. for the book and thought about it as the currency of it workplace experience as a resource. So as employees think about traveling to the office, it has to be appealing. It has to be compelling. The return on investment has to be it's time well spent or time well invested. So the barrier to entry for work is the currency of resource. So when we're thinking about or asset managers are thinking about the spaces that they create, they need to think about it from the point of view of the return of investment of employees. How do we make that experience feel like it was, it was a good investment of time and money to get there? And when people leave the office, they feel, I'm really glad I showed up today. I really got something out of this. It really added value to my working day because otherwise people will take the easy choice because as humans, that's what our brains do when we will choose to be in the place where we are because that's the notion of time well saved. Nicola, if, if you touch on this in the book with some of the case studies, this idea of measurement, I think is really interesting because obviously the, the headline is always, oh, people aren't coming back into the office. So do we need them or people are downsizing? But to Zoe's point, you don't need to necessarily measure how many people come in. You need to measure what's going on. And if what's going on with 30% occupancy is compelling and so good from a productivity point of view, you'd absolutely spend the money on the space. Are we seeing companies begin to think about how they measure what actually happens inside an office in a way that's meaningful? Slowly, to be honest. Yeah. And, and again, this was a conversation that was happening before COVID. And we have seen a shift, I think, where real estate has shifted from primarily reporting to finance to increasingly reporting to HR. I think that's helping. But the, the, the issue is that it's putting people into the realm, as Zoe said, of trying to measure stuff that's much harder to measure. So I think we need to go back to the purpose and why are we doing this? And for every organization, it's going to be different, right? Because they have a different set of objectives. So one of the things we, we noticed during the research was four emerging models of work communities. One is centered around 
social engagement. So the measures would be about engagement within the communities that are there and engagement within the community that it sits within. So the building very much is an integrator socially and lots of public realm, for example, as part of it, uh, rather than a tight boundary around. The second one was about an entrepreneurial community. And we saw those very connected to universities, very much about startups, new ideas, creation mode. So the measure there would be something different. It would be about new ideas, new products, new connections. And then the third one was about regeneration. Um, and that's about using master plans and hub buildings to catalyze social and economic regeneration across a city. And we see that particularly in bigger cities with large scale master plans like King's Cross, Brent Cross, Battersea, these sorts of places. And then the fourth one is interesting because it's what we called it is temporal. And that's effectively meaning that it's a meanwhile space, it's temporary. So it's mm. happening whilst the rest of the development is being built in order to engage with both the local community and the future community. So using the space as a measure of engagement. Well, so Rich, if I throw it back to you, I mean, there's, that talks to an awful lot of change to cities, which by their very nature, built environment, it's not easy to change, right? So um, we can't just knock it all down and start again. So talk a little bit about how cities can and are evolving to, to meet. Well, I think we probably all agree is an inexorable demand. This is the direction of travel. So it's, it has to happen for cities to survive, presumably. I think we can look back at precedents to help us understand this. At any time of major industrial or technological change like this, it inevitably is going to create, on the one hand, opportunities to do things in new ways, but on the other hand, destructive obsolescence in the form of things that are fixed in old ways. And obviously property, real estate is fixed by its very tangible nature. But you know, you look, you look back over history, you see in the first industrial shift, I mean, that defined cities, people start to move into cities from agricultural communities. You know, before 200 years ago, most people did not live in cities. I mean, that's that's quite mm -hmm. a, a fundamental point in this debate. But then again, another 100 years on from that, of course, the service shift and, and globalization meant that those factories that had been created in, and the cities built around them were offshore and now you had huge ghettos left where they where they stood. And often, in many cases, they were repurposed into residential. We, we also see other kind of technological distance-based changes, like I was talking about earlier, affect cities in a positive or, or growth-orientated way in terms of the train, for instance, created suburbanization, defined our cities in a way that we hadn't thought of previously. So yes, this change is definitely going to bring about obsolescence and new opportunities. I think it's interesting when people think about the workplace and change to the work model, people naturally think about the change to offices. But actually, I think this might have a bigger impact on wider assets around the city than it may even do to the office market. You think if people start to work in a hybrid model three days a week going forward, you're not going to rationalize that much space because you can't, if you're, if you're catering for peak demand, you still need those offices. Whereas a, a decision to commute less often could radically increase or differentiate how people choose to live, where they choose to live. That's probably going to be more impactful. But I, I think the successful real estate developers, the successful cities will grasp this change really quickly and, and they'll try and focus their assets and their cities on the new value proposition, which sits around all those things we were talking about today, like minimizing the impact on people's, poor impact on people's lives around our cities, but also maximizing the value that they gain from being near other people in the office. You have an office in the future and it doesn't allow you to collaborate, facilitate serendipity, I really wonder what the purpose of that office will be in that new environment. Yeah, so Zoe, big implications for everyone across the real estate industry. But how do you see that playing out with the, the occupiers and developers? Well, as Nicholas said, you know, it, we we have a lot of space and, the, and it takes a long time to change. But I think we have a great opportunity. Constraint really helps help innovation in a sense. You know, we never innovate in a vacuum. And I think so I think it is really rewriting the script on what the space can be. And I think it's, as I said, I think it's stepping back, having this interconnected view across organisations. So having a coalition that, that joins up the different elements of an organisation. So traditionally, you know, real estate make the decisions, the purpose, and they're probably not connected to the business. I think we've probably all walked into spaces in the past where, you know, for one group, maybe it was really efficient, you know, it really delivered on budget for the client, but you know what didn't really work for the people that had to work in that space, didn't work for the HR, wasn't aligned to the brand and culture. So I think this is a, a really great opportunity to think about how we can repurpose these spaces so it, it works for the whole business and the value that that organization needs to bring. We've got lots of examples in the book where you know, we've seen these repurposing of spaces, the, the Johnny Walker experience in Edinburgh, for example, that repurposes the old house 
out of Fraser store on Princess Street. You know, if you did just said, how do we reuse this shop? You would have come up with a very different answer. So I think thinking about, you know, the Peter Drucker quote, you know, it's not about coming up with the wrong solutions. I think we need to step back and ask the right questions. So it isn't about return to office. It isn't really about how we can reuse our space. It's really about what does our organisation need to be successful in the future when we're bringing our people together? What does that start to look like? And as Nicholas said, you know, there are those different realms. If it's about innovation, that's going to look vastly different than if it's about just having people sitting at their workstations and, and typing away. So I think we've got a real opportunity here to start to connect all the sensors. But I do think it is just about breaking the archetypes of work. Sorry, Michael, just want to highlight one thing that you said, Zoe, because I find it really important, which is around making sure that we're asking the right questions. And I think two big questions that are becoming more prominent is who is the space for on a much more diverse basis than we've ever really considered it, both at a city and at an individual building level? And what does it really mean to be human in those environments? And I mean that both from a biological perspective, there are big parts of our biology that are not really accommodated, even as an able-bodied person in the context of offices or retail, for example, moments like rest, you know, cities are taking their benches away at rapid rates for social reasons, for, for clear reasons, but we're not really fully accommodating the full breadth of what it means to be a human in those environments. And then that second point around who are we designing that space for, you know, this idea of disability, for example, whether that's visible or invisible disability, there is a, a growth rhetoric that actually it's the construct of the physical environment that creates the disability. My inability as a visually impaired person to navigate around the city, is that my issue? Or actually, are there elements that and adjustments we can make in the physical environment that will enable that capability loss to be less lossful in a way? No, I agree. And I think everything you all have been saying is this, is about this shift away from designing for every for everyone in the same way to designing for the individual, right? And we recognize more and more that there's so many different ways that people work so many different ways in which they want to live and we and we're smart enough to design for all of them so i think there's this sort of big shift before we uh, wrap up with with you nicola rich and we talk quite a lot about social impact and i know there's a chapter in the in the book on that do you just want to unpack that a little bit more mm, yeah i mean i think it relates to a lot of the subjects we've been talking about today obviously as, as a as a factor of the, of the bigger subject of esg it's incredibly important to the real estate environment going forward i think it's not driving positive social impact is not just a good thing to do for society and, and and the planet it's also the right thing to do financially in many respects if you think about you know the factors we're talking about earlier about experience serendipity etc and this also breeds into personal identity and the association of place with personal identity which is a key factor for particularly younger people but also a, a much broader uh, range of people so you know, from a, from an investor and a development perspective having a really clear proposition on what the building stands for and how that supports the identity of individuals is going to be important to overcoming regulation uh, it's going to be important on the fundraising side of, of raising capital at balance sheet level for development it's important for corporate brand and placemaking customer base employees so, so these factors are all very much kind of embedded within a general philosophy of supporting communities and, and generating a balanced scorecard approach to an investor's performance. It's not just the financial return anymore. And of course, this is so important because real estate is such a visible manifestation of these credentials, but it also, it can be hugely destructive and accretive at the same point to place if you get it right or wrong. Poor interventions from on a real estate side can be destructive on, on communities and they can be destructive on people's lives in, in the same way that really great city and and community design led by strong placemaking and real estate strategies can really add value to people's lives. And I really hope that one of the things we see coming out of this period is a much stronger focus on how real estate can serve the needs of a much broader section of stakeholders in society. So Nicola, if I bring it back to the book and maybe just to sort of wrap up, are all these themes that, that you write about, are they coming through in these case studies? Are you finding people are experimenting more than they're saying, I've got the answer? Because I think that's always is a, a danger, isn't it? That people you're designing at a point in time with what information you know, and what we're saying is it's changing and there's more change to come. Yeah, so I'm sort of curious if companies, both designing space or indeed developers, owners are beginning to figure out how to design with that change in mind. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and again, that's that's a dynamic that can work against some of the traditionally held principles in the real estate and construction industry, which is decide everything as early as possible 
possible so that you're guaranteed price and you're guaranteed program and then you crack on and do that for 18 months regardless of whether there's a pandemic or not so i think it's really challenging all of that now to getting to and you can see this a lot with the corporates where they have the opportunity to test and measure over time you know we'll create a pilot project here we'll test and measure a series of principles we'll move on to the next we're working with a lot of organizations that are doing that more holistically but there's still a huge amount of work to go there it is a struggle to get people to work in an integrated way and to ask questions that are about the nature of work rather than the nature of place, actually. So starting with work culture and then working out to what that means for place. But certainly this research has been very optimistic in terms of the enduring importance of place in an increasingly virtual and dispersed world. As humans, we will never not meet each other in person. We will never not be physically somewhere. So the role of place is more important than ever. And it's our role to really capture that in the most meaningful way that sustains health, it sustains engagement, that sustains productivity. Great. I think we can wrap it up there. Just to say the book comes out on general release June 1st. So available at the RIBA bookshop. Sounds really interesting. I know there's lots of case studies in there as, as well as a lot of research that's gone into it. So it's a very thoughtful book. So I'd encourage everyone to think about buying it and reading it and using it. So thank you all very much for joining me and best of luck. Thanks, Michael.